Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to the good old days here. I'm going to use the whiteboard. I want to thank uh, the Pontifical University and the Jagiellonian University for making it possible for me to be here, and my colleagues and friends in Krakow, and especially Professor Adam Oshevsky for allowing me to be with you today, especially on a day when we are honoring Professor Pavla Materna. Thank you for all that you've done. I have three, th three things to tell you. All right, the first is I want to give definitive answers to two questions that have yet to be answered today. What is negation? And what is a truth value? Second, I'm going to rehearse an old, well-known fact, tell you about it a little bit, and then in the third part give it a little spin. The well-known fact is if you take any model whatsoever of classical set theory. I don't care what the set theory is. You can add large cardinals. You can add malo cardinals, various axioms of higher infinity. It can be extended conservatively to a model of an intuitionistic set in class theory that extends it. In that intuitionistic model, as we shall see, negation has its, we would say, intuitionistic and not its classical meaning. That's part two. Part three, you will remember way back when, when Karl Popper and others thought that they could define the meanings of logical connectives by stipulating rules of derivation. And I thought Arthur Pryor had destroyed this ultimately many years ago with his great paper on Tonk, right? His inconsistent connective dis defined by stipulated rules. Now you would have thought that that would have ended the discussion forever. But like zombies and Dracula and Frankenstein's monster, the idea that somehow laying down inference rules determines the meaning of a connective will not die. So I'm going to take another whack at it. I brought a silver bullet and a stake, and I'm going to try doing away with the Dracula of defining meanings of connectives by laying down inference rules of various sorts today. Try to end it definitively. A couple of preliminary remarks. I'm going to work in the weakest meta-theory that I can, right, to cover as many logics as I possibly can and to avoid as many objections as I can. I'm going to be working in the lattice of logics over intuitionistic logic, the so-called intermediate logics, that is between intuitionistic logic and classical logic inclusive. Right? That means I'm ruling out, at least for the moment, paraconsistent logics. Why is this? Because ex falso quod libet, right, is equivalent in set theory to the claim that the empty set is a subset of every class in every set. I need that last thing to get started at all. So I'm not going to be talking paraconsistently today. Second preliminary remark, I reject categorically the ideas that there's some special intuitionistic, I'm an intuitionist, okay? There are special intuitionistic meanings of the connectives. Right? I reject this categorically. One of the reasons for it is clear. I'm talking to you, and you understand me. I'm not using secret meanings of the words and, or, not, and if, then. I'm using their ordinary meanings, which you already know. But while I do my construction, I'm going to presuppose this view just to show that it's wrong at the end, or contribute to showing that it's wrong at the end. Now, what is negation and what is a truth value? When we start talking about negations and truth values, we're often writing down little pictures like this for ourselves and our students. A little truth table for negation. The corner is negation. And that is absolutely right, and I'm going to prove that it's right. But now I start by asking, what are these T's and F's, Frege's var und falsch, right? what are they really? And I'm going to argue that they have to be subsets of singleton zero. They're subsets of a singleton set. Those are the truth values. And there would be nothing wrong with thinking that way. Why? Because I can take any statement and map it into something, statement P, map it into a collection, P hat, 
And what is p hat? It's the collection of all things that are in this set and p. Just for each statement. And simple set in class theory tells me that this thing exists. It's a subset of that. But moreover, because of extensionality, two statements have the same truth value if and only if their respective hats are the same, right? Because if I put Q in here, P if and only if Q, if I put Q in here, I can prove that those are the same set. So that this tells me that the Q hats represent intuitively the truth values of statements. Two sentences of the same statement have the same value if and only if their hats are the same, and conversely. The hat mapping is an onto mapping because, right, it's an onto mapping because if I take any subcollection of this thing S, the statement that zero belongs to S, if I take that hat, that's just S itself. Right? If I start with a subset of this and I form this statement, zero belongs to it, the hat of that has to be S. Try it. Exercise. Turn in your paper tomorrow, I'll mark it. Right? This map is onto. It's an onto map. Every subset of this comes out of the map, and the map is one to one on truth values. And of course, I can extend the map here. This thing maps to union. P or Q maps to the union of P hat and Q hat. P and Q maps to intersection. And negation just maps to the complement of a set. So if I look at corner P, what does it map to? It's hat. It's, and that's just the complement of P hat. So I can raise this up to an isomorphism between truth values and this object, the set of all subsets of that. And in fact, I can, if I allow that these subsets of this are the truth values, I can define negation. I don't have to assume it. I can define it outright. Why? If I take a look at any, and I want to talk about its negation or complement, that's just the union of all A in that collection, such that A intersection S gives me the empty set. Right? This defines the negation or complement of S. It's just the largest thing in there that is disjoint from S. Does this thing flip over? Oh my god, I love technology. So negation can be defined as an operation on truth values that is just this. With that background, I can define what it means for an inference to be valid. And we're just going to look at propositional inferences. So assume that I've got some propositional formula and I can derive another one. And these are formulas and variables like P and Q. What does it mean for such an inference to be valid? It just means that if I take the hat of this thing, I told you how to take the hat of something, it is going to be a subset of the hat of this thing for all P and Q. This is what it means to set theoretic statement, right? For any subsets of singleton zero, take the hat of this and the hat of that. This is a subset of that. Then in this inference is valid. Very simple definition of what it means for a propositional inference to be valid. Now, this determines that some particular inferences are valid. Inferences like false derives anything. Why? What is false? It's the empty set, and this is subset. So the empty set is a subset of everything. Right? The phi and corner phi 
has to drive right, the least proposition. Why? Because the intersection of a set with its complement has to be empty. And if this happens, right, negation introduction, right? If a pair of sets here is smaller than the least one, then gamma has to be a subset of the complement of theta. These are all valid inferences. And if I assume that there are only two truth values, the converse of this also works. The negative form of or negation elimination. So if I assume that there are only two truth values or that this set is classical, this one holds. These are the intuitionistic laws of negation. These are the classical laws of negation. And they are valid, provably valid, on this. Did you have a question, Marie? Did I? It's not, because I can drop a negation. If I can derive a contradiction from a formula and a negated formula, then given the assumption formulas, I can drop negation off. Right, thank you very much. Now, in the third part of my talk, I'm going to ask if this process could be reversed. If by laying down inferences like this, you could in fact determine the meanings of the connectives. You could determine that this thing, say, has classical properties by laying down classical laws, intuitionistic properties by only laying down intuitionistic laws. That's what I'm going to be asking in the third part, whether I can reverse this process. In the second part, I'm just going to mention, oh, thank you, Adam. What does a philosopher do without an eraser? Gary Da would be appalled if we couldn't erase stuff. I just want to repeat, given any model M of classical set theory, I can extend it to a model M tau of intuitionistic set theory by adding truth values to M. Particularly, you can think of adding truth values since we're in Krakow, Great Poland, from the Sierpinski space. The Sierpinski space. Right? It's the little Sierpinski space is a little space generated by this ordered set where we look at the upward closed sets. The upward closed sets on are empty. Uh, this one here, just this point, which I call mid. And the whole thing, call it S for Sierpinski. These are the three upward closed subsets of that little ordered set. We can add these to M as truth values by thinking of sets as functions from the domain of M into these three sets, let's just call it Sierpinski tau. So I interpret now the set variables as functions from here into here. And then I can use this idea, I can interpret an entire set theory, right? I can say that the meaning of an element, A here is an element of the domain of this, the meaning of this is going to be take the function A and evaluate it on A. And then I can carry on with conjunction and disjunction in just the usual way. This is just the intersection which you have in Sierpinski space of the meanings of those two, quantifiers and so on all the way. Where now, what's in the Scott brackets or semantic brackets is going to always going to be one of these three. And what property does this have? First, 
m tau makes true intuitionistic set theory with full typed comprehension. In other words, in m tau, these first three laws turn out to be valid, but lot, not law number four. And why is this? Because it turns out that here, the complement of mid, the complement of this, isn't the set containing these two, it so happens. It's just empty. So that when I take mid union, the complement of mid, what I get then is just mid. But to be true in this model, as it happens, for this model to actually satisfy something, this means that the value of that set has to be S, the whole thing, the top truth value. However, and importantly, if I look at MT restricted right, to ordinary set theory, It is identical with the theory of M. The theory of M, restricted to classical set theory, isn't changed. So in MT, you have a classical core of ordinary set theory, all the axioms you want, embedded inside an intuitionistic set theory that's conservative over it. Okay. Now, this is well known. Part three, can we seriously maintain now that by writing down rules like these four, I've determined that the truth values I'm manipulating by using this negation operator are classical and not intuitionistic. Let me remind you of something if I have a few seconds. Do I have, have yes. a few seconds? Remember Hillary Putnam's little argument from 1973 or 1974 about twin Earth? Right? He argued, to use his expression, that meanings cannot be in the head. What he meant by this is that the denotation of a word is not determined by narrowly contented mental entities. Simply speaking, your ideas about water cannot determine that the word water coming out of your mouth means H2O and not something else. How does he try to show this? He imagines a possible world called Twin Earth, which is just like Earth before 1750. Right? But in Twin Earth, there's a substance XYZ. It fills oceans. It fills lakes. We drink it. We bathe in it. Right? It smells just like water, but it's not water. It has all the secondary properties of water all the visible, auditory, tactual properties of water, but isn't water. Now, someone on Earth before 1750 would be in exactly the same mental state as a twin Earth person, right, at the same era. But the word water out of the mouth of the twin Earthian names XYZ. The word water out of the mouth of the Earthian names H2O. He concludes, therefore, that, right, the mental content that you associate with a word cannot determine what it denotes. Now, I'm not endorsing this argument, but I'm drawing a parallel. This argument is this. A classical mathematician could work his or her entire lifetime using all the classical rules of classical logic, all four of these principles, and a complete set theory of whatever he or she wants. And yet, it's perfectly possible that for all he or she knows, all of those statements are true in here are hold in a non-standard universe in which, in which there are three truth values and not two, and they satisfy non-classical principles globally. The law of the excluded third, for example, fails there. So therefore, all that the classical mathematician can ever do, all the mathematics in the world, done classically, right? not just the logical rules you lay down, Right? but contentual things that you prove and say, all of that will not determine that the connectives that you use 
Name the connectives that you think you are using. Name, in fact, classical negation rather than intuitionistic negation. Thank you very much.